Minecraft 1.20 is right around the corner, and it's bringing with it some exciting new features, including hanging signs, cherry trees, the sniffer, and armor trims. Now, when I heard about armor trims, I was ecstatic. You see, since they introduced netherite, everyone's been running around in all black. That's my thing. So now, everyone can express their beautiful personalities with whatever color combinations they please. Meanwhile, I'll stick with black. Well, actually, you know what? Maybe I'll experiment too. Maybe something like uh, black and blue, black and purple, black and yellow. You know what it is. But besides getting my individuality back, it got me wondering what I can do with it redstone-wise. Well, this feature did just make armor a lot more exclusive, so what if I sold complete sets of it, like designer clothing, in a boutique shop with an awesome automated shopping experience? Dang, I'm smart. So here's the general idea. The customer would walk up to a catalog and see the descriptions and prices of everything that's available at the shop. Then, when they find out one that they want to check out, then they push this button to summon it into the display case. If they decide, nah, I don't want this, then they can pick another one from the catalog to swap it out with. But if they decide they want to try it on, then they can hit this button, and the armor would then be dispensed onto them. They can then try it on, strike a pose, whatever. If they decide they don't want it after all, then they can put it into this chest to return it. However, if they want to buy it, then they can deposit their payment into this chest, and the machine will count up the money, and when they've paid enough, then they've purchased the armor. That's right, I wanted to automatically keep track of unique prices for all the armor trims. Wish me luck. Oh yeah, and I also want to implement a refund mechanism just in case a customer overpays or partially pays and then returns the item. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And before you rush to the comments to say that this can all be replaced with a row of armor stands and the honor system, shh, that's not the spirit of over-engineering. Let's get started. So where do you even start with a project like this? Well, since we're using a lectern and signal strength in order to determine which one we want, I think a good place to start would just be a red coder. All right, so that's our red coder built. And as you can see, as I, oh, maybe you can't see. Yeah, as you can see, as I stand over here and flip the pages, you can see that which torch lights up uh, is corresponding to the page number that I'm currently on. So four, five, six, seven, and so on. So that's how we're gonna be able to choose which armor trim that we want. Now, of course, we can't exactly leave it like this because then, you know, armor pieces will be just kind of like falling out of the system as the customer flips pages, which is obviously not what we want. So instead, if we invert each of these outputs by adding another torch like this, and we have our hopper line that will deliver our armor items down this way, and then we have another set of hoppers that are gonna be taken from a container, like a barrel, and this is where we're gonna have our armor. Well then, yeah, all of them but one are locked, which is a good thing, but that changes every single time the user flips a page. So that's not very good. So we wanna be able to choose when the output of these torches gets forwarded onto this line here. And so in order to do so, we can sort of modify it to kind of move that over to here, right? So instead of the torch being there, now the torch is here, and then we can put another repeater over back over here so that when you flip the page, it reflects on this torch, but it no longer reflects on this torch until you put a block here, which we're gonna do with a piston. Okay, so now with those modifications made to the rest of the red coder, you can see that as I flip the pages, none of these torches turn off, but the output is still reflected over here. Then we can just push an entire line of blocks behind these repeaters, and then only one of them will get forwarded onto this torch for a short amount of time, which will unlock the hopper that will be sitting right above it, and it will send those four pieces of armor through the hopper line that's gonna be going this direction. And at this point, you can flip to a certain page, say page number five, 
It doesn't reflect here until you push those blocks over it, it reflects for a moment, and then it goes back to being locked. Perfect. All right, so now that we've got the red coder somewhat figured out, uh, we can start thinking about the infrastructure of what the inventory is gonna look like. So we have a bunch of barrels here with hoppers right underneath them, which are locked at all times until you decide to unlock them like so. And we have a line of hoppers going in this direction to carry all the items of armor. And then we also have this return line running over all of these barrels so that we can return the armor. And uh, that's what we're gonna be working on right now. So I'm thinking that we can use the fullness of the barrel in order to lock or unlock these hoppers so that the system knows which one to return it to, if that makes sense. So we can use that knowledge to our advantage to read off of this barrel. And as you can see, it'll only reach this hopper to lock it when we get to a signal strength of three. Now I know it's locking this one as well, but since there's gonna be a bunch of stuff next to it, it's gonna be no problem. I'm gonna go ahead and fill out the rest. All right, so we've got all those filled out, and as you can see, we've actually got some items in here as well. Just as placeholders, we've got leather, we've got chain, we've got iron, and we've got gold here. So let's say for instance that we have taken iron out and we place them into this return line here. And so when this closes, we should see, there we go, it lights up because it goes over these hoppers, which are locked, and then it goes over this one, which is unlocked, and it only locks when everything is in there. And as you can see, it doesn't unlock until, oh wait, hold on. Yeah, that's that wouldn't normally be extended, but as you can see, I can choose whichever one, say number two, for instance, which is uh, chain mail. And if I pulse this, wait for it to drain, and then come back, you can see that, yes, I've got chainmail. So let's work on making that happen automatically. So when we send armor back down this line in order to request a new one, we need to actually wait for it to drop into its respective barrel before we send a new one. So the way that I'm thinking to detect whether or not this has actually gone in is actually I'm going to mirror this like this on this other side, like so and watch for this end piece of redstone to change with an observer. So something like, oop. Yeah, so there we go, we filled out the rest and as you can see, any change in any of these last pieces of redstone is going to send a pulse here. Now, unfortunately, the pulse is way too short. It's just going to spit out those blocks. So we're gonna have to outfit this with a quick pulse extender. All right, quick literal uh, pulse extender on both sides. And this actually should be good. So I'm just gonna take this chainmail armor. So what should happen when I put it in the chest is it's gonna go down this hopper line. It's going to drop into this hopper here, which will fill up the barrel. The barrel will then fill all the way up, which will turn this back on, and of course, turn this back on, which will pulse this line, trigger the pulse extender, which will trigger this entire line of blocks to extend over top of these torches. Then this torch will power through the block into this repeater, into this torch, and we should momentarily see this one turn off and then turn back on and we should see leather armor. So let's see if that actually does happen. Okay. And, ooh, that's pretty long, but yeah, we do see leather come into here. I'm gonna try to shorten the pulse. Let's see what happens when I do that. Yeah, definitely long enough. I'll take it. And now sometimes we probably don't want to trigger a re-request every single time that the armor comes back. So I just added this line over here with these two pistons. All right, so now let's simulate a real customer call. Let's choose number three, for instance. And let's push this button. 
and ooh, yeah, something went wrong. Yeah, you know what? I guess sometimes my gut instinct is the best. Let's go ahead and call number three one more time. Really long pulse, but yeah, there we go. So let's say we want uh, leather armor. Put that back in. And we should, in theory, there we go. And we see leather armor right there. All right, so that's all fine and dandy. So let's start to make our in-stock indicator. So there we go, a quick little piston and a slime block and a regular block on the end of that. And we have repeaters here. And so basically when this gets pushed down in front of the repeaters, then it will go into this line. Now, because we do have slime blocks involved now, we're gonna have to change all of these out with, uh, you know, non-sticky blocks. Oh, I was really hoping I could alternate honey and slime and honey and slime and have them not stick to each other, but unfortunately, this is gonna stick to that. So when we get rid of this, yeah, it really does just kind of ruin everything. And the thing is, honey blocks are transparent, so you can't power through them. So you're gonna need a block on the end of it anyway. Unfortunate. Zigzag is the way to go. And there we go. Looking like a hot rod engine or something. So now for paying purposes, the machine needs to remember the last thing that the player selected so that it knows how much to charge for it, right? So we need some sort of latching mechanism to come off of these torches. The player can have one set of armor checked out, but also have a different set of armor selected using the book. And so we can't just use the output of this red coder because then the prices would be constantly changing. So in order to get signal from this torch into more lines that can go next to each other, we kind of have no choice but to use redstone line. Now that's kind of bad news because as you can see, it all lights up. But I do have a trick up my sleeve. So this is a relatively unknown redstone mechanic where a comparator can read a container through a block. Now that's pretty normal, that's common knowledge. But the weird part is it continues to read this container and as you can see, these composters are empty, so these two are continuing to read these containers. Now this one isn't, only because its block is powered by a signal strength of 15. This one here is powered by a signal strength of 14, and this one 13, as you can see from the sidebar over there. What this means is you can use a system like this to only get one output from a fully powered redstone line. And so we're going to use the same trick again to get it even lower and get into this RS NOR latch array. And the way that we're going to pass this into this is we're just going to raise a big line of slime blocks. All right, there we go. The rest of it built and it hooked up to this pulse extender here. Yeah, sure. We'll check out number two. So we'll see number two come through here, chainmail armor. Number two lit up there, perfect. Now we're going to go for number three. Number two is still good there. Put that back in and we should see, there we go. And it switches over to number three and number three is now in our possession. Looks really good. So now we're gonna forward this right up into the payment system. So these droppers here are facing into each other and I'm thinking that we can put, I don't know, just like some sort of like custom price. So this one costs five diamonds. This one costs 22 diamonds. This one costs three diamonds, four diamonds, something like that. And what would happen is based on whichever one is selected, like uh, number three is selected, right? You can see that this particular torch is off. And so when you kind of pulse this line, then it'll start pushing items from this dropper into this dropper. And that's how it will count your money. And after this has been completely bought, meaning that all four or however many, right? Nuggets have been pushed from this side to this side then this will turn off and it will lock the hopper. So as you can see, these two still haven't been bought. So these two torches are still off, 
which means that these two hoppers here are still able to take items from the return line. Now, of course, we also want to pulse this line right here to push uh, any incomplete payments from this dropper back into this dropper. And so this will be for the refund system, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, of course, we would want to know if there are any incomplete payments. So we would take a reading off of these droppers here and forward them into this big line. But of course, we don't want this line to be on when someone has completed a purchase. So whenever that happens, we can drain it into this hopper here by taking a line all the way from the output here. So when this is completely empty, then this will be unlocked and it will drain this dropper. On second thought, let's make use of a hopper minecart instead of a regular hopper over there, because in case you didn't know, hopper minecarts can drain chests way faster than a regular hopper can. So as you can see, we have a full stack of 64 iron nuggets in each of these chests. And if I go ahead and, oh, hold on. There we go. Now you can see it a lot easier. So whichever one turns off first, you can see uh, which one drains faster. So three, two, one. And boom, just like that, a whole stack has been emptied faster than this thing. Could even do like, I don't know, 10, something like that. So hopper minecart it is. All right, so unfortunately that means we're gonna have to destroy some of our work over here. Um, but let's see, just about here is where we need to place our activator rails. And uh, oh yeah, we're gonna have to have them face Let's see, we're gonna have to have them face this way. We're gonna have to alternate two and, f oh, and four, and then take care of the four first, then the two, two, then four, take care of the four first, and then the two, and so on. All right, so now that we're done with that, we can just kind of punch these out uh, as we please. Now, they need to be under, this dropper yeah so we're gonna go ahead and punch all of those out no problem at all all right so now with all of our work restored we can go ahead and start placing our mine that's annoying no worries i know how to fix this so we just place a bunch of top slabs like so and then we can place them down like so right next to each other and oh my goodness what they're not even touching each other. So I looked this up to see what it's all about, and apparently it's a bug that's been open since 2013. What the heck, Moyang? Apparently if you place minecarts next to each other like this facing north and south, this is what happens. But it doesn't happen with east and west. So if you're making this contraption at home, make sure to make it east and west. Alright, how do I get rid of this noise? Because I need it to be off. Uh, maybe, maybe blocks? I know, that'd be kind of sad though, wouldn't it? Nope, not blocks. Maybe friendly creatures? I mean, it is an entity. Oh, apparently minecarts are friendly creatures. All right, so now that we have some peace and quiet, we can now just double up these slabs to make them into full blocks and uh, just, just, you know, forget about the ruckus. And now the last thing we need is to detect when the player has actually finished a purchase, which means that this comparator would turn off. Now, I think we can just kind of replace these with uh, observers facing down, uh, put these back on top like so, and then have them go into a, oop, into a line of redstone like this. And then we can also just block off that redstone from connecting to there and uh, yeah that should be good and you know what I'm gonna go ahead and end it here for today and I think we've done pretty well for this part I mean we've got full inventory management over there and we've got full pricing management just over here which is a huge step to making this all work which we'll do in part two that'll be coming out next week so get subscribed so you don't miss it oh and if you're here from the future it's already on your screen Thanks for watching, and I'll see you there. Bye-bye.